In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. As we heard in the Gospel today, Christ is the Lord. He raises the son of the widow of Nain, an only son to a widow. A very difficult situation, as we all know. And it is the fourth Sunday of the month of Baba, which the Sundays talk about who Christ is, what can he do, what authority does he have, what, um, what is this God exactly. Today it, it tells us and it teaches us that Christ have authority over death. And that's a very crucial topic for us. Death is something that we all stand before and we cannot comprehend. We don't understand death. What is death? How do we, do, how do we deal with it? How do we conquer death? How can we beat it? As humans, we have overcome many dangers, but death stands still. So when we come in front of death, we're confused. We don't know what this is. As long as we look at it in a perspective away from the gospel, and what Christ taught us about death, we will not understand. We will not be able to comprehend the magnitude, the gravity of this event on our life. Today, Christ saw a funeral walking out of the city, going to bury a son of a widow who just died. And back in the days when someone dies, they don't wait. They get the coffin, they put him in, in his casket, and they, they do the rituals, and they carry him, they dig a tomb, and they put him in the tomb. They, actually, this, this system is still used in Egypt until today. They don't wait to bury people. They just bury them on the same day they die. So if we, if we may say he just died fresh. And Christ was teaching with his disciples, and then he saw the funeral going outside the doors of the city, going out to bury this young man. Just to give you a little background of what is um, the situation uh, of this widow. A widow means that her husband died. When a husband dies of the family, he is the one that supports the family. Because back in the days, women didn't work. They did not work. They are not able to make a living on their own and to support a house. So the only hope that was left to this lady was her son, because he is a young man. He can go out, he can work, make some livings, and support the house. But even that one last hope was taken away from her, which is kind of sad. And, and, and if you think about it, it's, um, it's not an easy situation. Forget the fact that he is the one that can support the house. It's a son. How much do we love our kids? We love our kids. We love them to death. If I have to die for my own kids, I will. This is how bad it was and how, um, how sad it was for this lady. And the thing that's very interesting about this, um, about this miracle that no one asked Christ the situation itself, the scene that he saw, was more than enough for him to step in. And he did something very interesting. In the, uh, in the Jewish uh, traditions, and it's actually in the law, if, if you are in a, in a house or a tent and someone dies in this household that you are in, you are impure for the rest of the day. Okay, these are the laws. It, it's actually in the book of Deuteronomy. So... If someone dies in the same household that you are staying in, you are impure for, to the end of the day. It's not a sin, but impure means that you cannot approach the holies. That's what impure means. Okay? It doesn't mean that they're sinners, but they just mean it means that they cannot approach the holies or go to the altar that day. They have to wait until the end of the day, then do the purification rituals, which is washing with waters and whatnot, until they get pure again. So... Same thing goes for those who touch the dead man. They are impure to the end of the day, okay? 
And here's what Christ did today. He actually, he goes in and he, do, he does what? He came forth and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. That's interesting. He touched the coffin and everyone that was carrying the, the coffin walking to bury this, this young man, everyone stopped. You know why they stopped? Hmm? Let's say that they didn't know who Christ was. But what, what, what he did here was out of the normal. Nobody other than the assigned people to carry the coffin is allowed to touch the coffin because now you are impure to the end of the day. So Christ, before he raised the dead young man from the death, he touched the coffin before saying anything. So everyone stood. It's like Christ is trying to tell us, whatever impurity you have, it's not going to defile me. Whatever impurity you have, it's not going to defile me. It's like those who are narrow-minded. It's like, oh, now Christ has to go back home and wash up and stay away from the holies until the end of the day. Well, guess what? He is the holies. He is the holy. It's like those who think like this. The sun rays come from up above and go through the trash and kills the bacteria and microbes, right? The, it, can we say that the bacteria actually defile the sun rays? No, it's not like that. Those who are narrow-minded would think like, oh, now Christ has to go and, and do the rituals of purification. No, he does not. He is the source of purity. He can cleanse this. And that's what he did. He stopped the coffin, he stopped the funeral, and then he told the young man, young man, I say to you, arise. And this is what I want to discuss with you today. Christ have authority over death. As we discussed in the past few weeks, he has authority over disease. When he raised the paralyzed man from his disease, his illness, he has authority over nature, the miracle of catching the multitude of fish. He has authority over sin. When he healed um, the, same, the same paralyzed man, and he has authority over Satan himself. Last week we saw him casting out a demon from a man who was blind, mute, and mad or crazy. And today we see him have authority over the last enemy that we face, which is death. Now, from this perspective, I want to discuss with you what death is. Death is the last enemy that will be defeated. Death is the last enemy that will be defeated in, in, the, in the last day. He's already defeated, death is defeated, because now we look at death as a gateway between two worlds. It's not the end. Death is not the end. Death is a new beginning. Now, only those who have hope in, in the afterlife can understand this. Those who have no hope will not understand this. Those who can see when they walk into the church, they look at the dome and they look at the saints and they look at the, all these icons around us, they will, it's, it's kind of the same message, the message that the church is telling us by the building and by the icon itself, that this is not the end of the life. It's, this is just here is a preparation for the life to come. Death is just a gateway to another life. So those who are scared of uh, their life ending or scared of disease or just scared of certain sin or scared of Satan, I tell you, my beloved, Christ has conquered all of those. What else can you be afraid of? I can tell you one thing. I can be afraid of my own self. This is something I need to watch for. I cannot trust my own decisions sometimes. And this is why, this is why the real enemy is not really far from us. The real enemy is our own will that we have to purify with the word of God. That's why those who trust so much in themselves are deceived. If you trust, if you're so confident in your choices, if you're so confident about what you do, then you are deceived. This is the battle now. Christ has told us the way, 
has shown us that he is the constant, the strong one that can conquer everything, not us. So if we have trust, it shouldn't be in ourselves. It should be in him. That's that, and this is the new peril. I see a lot of people, especially young men, they talk very confidently, which is a good thing, but they don't understand sometimes that this is just the first step to feed the pride, the inner pride. And um, yesterday we were in uh, Detroit attending uh, an ordination of a new priest at the church uh, that's in Shelby. It was a, a very joyful event. And Amber Gregory from the Southern Diocese um, used one of the stories that Saint, no, it's not a story, it's, a, it's like a teaching um, analogy that Saint Michaelius the Great used to teach his disciples. And he said, the sin inside our, our hearts is like an onion. So it's like layers. You keep cutting through the layers and you're removing the sins, right? One sin after the other until you reach the heart of that one onion. The one sin that's coiled up inside, that's the one sin that you need to face the most. That is the real enemy. That's inside of us. And sometimes, if not, it's mostly 99% of the time, it's our own ego. It's our own pride. It's what we do. It's how we act based on our own motivations that we needed to be cleansed through the word of the Lord. That's why when we talk about authority over death, I'd like also to talk to you about the submission to God, how to submit to God. The word submission is not very well accepted these days because it reflects in the new generation concept, it reflects weakness. Submission is not weakness. Submission is actually a source and a sign of strength. Translate the word submit to commit, and you will understand what it means. Yakhda, yani yaltazim. Submit means someone who commit. You want to submit to the church means commit to the commandments of the Lord. That's what it means to submit. And when you submit, you're facing the worst enemy that you can face, which is our own pride, our own ego. When we submit to God, it's not a negative thing to do. Some people associate submission with just bowing their heads and doing nothing. Wrong. That's not submission. That's defeatness. That's someone who's defeated, don't know what to do. No, that's not submission. Submission means you know the rules, you know the commandments, you choose to stick to them, you choose to do them with your own free will. This is what commitment and submission is. Think about this one. In every wedding, we say this to the, to the wife, and we also say to the man, because it's from the Bible. We say, uh, wife, submit your husband. And most people translate the word submit as just to bow her heads and say, hadr, hadr, and that's all. No, that's not what submission is. Submission is to know what you need to do, to know the duties of your new position as a wife, and do them. It's not a negative move, it's a positive move. It's never God, God never wants us to be an idle people. He doesn't want us to be negative people. He wants us to be positive people. So if we translate the word submission to commitment, we will understand what it means. If we submit to the word of the Lord, which means commit to the commandments of the Lord and listen to his words, when we do that, we will see the victory that Christ has given us over sins, over nature, over disease, over Satan, and even over death. It's not difficult. When we commit to the commandments, which basically come down to prayers, pray, talk to God. Talk to God even for a few minutes every now and then during the day. For a few minutes, you feel like you're troubled, you feel you don't have peace, you feel you're alone, close your eyes, open your heart, and ask for help. It's not difficult. God is not too far from us. If the, if the real enemy is not too far from us, then also the real strength is not too far from us. It's also inside of us. 
But we need to tap onto that source to know what to do. The word of God, the word of God is mighty and strong. Only to those who follow it, who stick to it, who wants to abide and commit to the word of God. Those who commit to the word of God will see real resurrection in their life. They will fear no death. They will fear no disease. They will fear nothing from the enemy has to scare us with. Those who commit to the word of God, those who submit to the word of God, will always be strong. To him is glory forever and ever. Amen.